muscle memory. That's a phrase that we've all heard, whether we've taken some kind of training, uh, played any kind of sports or anything like that where there's more repetitive movement to try to increase your skill in that particular task. But did you know that you could practice your draw from a holster while you were laying on a couch with your eyes closed? To better understand that, first we have to fully understand what the phrase muscle memory actually means. To begin with, muscles have no memory, none. Muscles themselves remember nothing. The brain does. Your brain stores and remembers certain muscle movement and sequences. Changes of what the brain stores for future use occurs during skill learning and training and memory alters that information that the brain sends out to the muscles performing the actions. These memories are stored in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum where the brain encodes data and records whether various actions are right or wrong. So we basically take the human brain and look at it and the cerebellum, of course my brain is gonna to wanna to fall apart now, but the cerebellum is essentially this green section right at the lower base of the skull, uh, or the base of the brain itself down in the skull, kind of where the spinal cord is gonna take off and go down into your spine. Now in that cerebellum, this is where the brain determines, was this action right or was this action wrong? And it tries to eliminate the wrong ones based on your repetition and what you're doing and kind of negates those, but focuses more energy on those correct actions going forward in the future. Researchers have actually done studies with MRI on how the brain learns new skills and the white matter in the brain, which is long fibers that connect different parts of the brain together, they found that after training of new skills took place, there was an increase in the white matter connections between regions of the brain involved with various muscles and even vision and hearing. This increased white matter in the brain is permanent, so it does not change. So the next time you train, it's still there and results in faster, more efficient sharing of data between the brain and muscles. So just because you're not training right now, and maybe you haven't trained for a while, doesn't mean that you lose that. That white matter that's taking place and connecting all the different portions of the brain to one another that sends signals to these different muscles in your body, all that stays in place. You don't lose that white matter, in, that increase in white matter over time. It, it remains there. Now, learning new skills also changes the primary motor cortex. That's essentially, if you, if you took a marker and ran it across the brain right here, it's essentially this strip that goes straight across the brain and it's about as wide as my finger that connects right across here. I know that's not perfect because the, the brain itself here, the model is not color coded, but essentially if you took, look where my finger is beneath it all the way across, that's where that primary motor, uh, motor cortex is. Again, that's the area of the brain responsible for causing action. So cells in the primary motor cortex make connections with other neurons that travel down the spinal cord and contact muscles of the body. Now, using transcranial magnetic stimulation, that's a lot to say for a guy as dumb as me. Using this to apply small magnetic pulses to the surface of the scalp, researchers found that people with various skills had differing representation of muscles in the motor cortex. For instance, professional string players had much larger areas representing their left hands, meaning a greater number of connections from the brain to the muscles of that left hand than say the right hand. So a guy like Max Michel would have a much greater number of connections in his right arm and his right hand as say the left arm and left hand, simply because he's utilizing more action and more changes in his, his position and his direction with his right hand than simply steadying the gun and gripping it with the left hand once he's got his sights on target. Now you might be wondering how often should we be practicing? You know, researchers have gone back and forth on this and more recent studies actually show that you get more out of your practice if you have more breaks in between. Do not beat yourself up with these long, crazy, enduring uh, practice sessions that are just like, wow, you know, you just get worn out, you get bad, you get sloppy, your practice gets sloppy. Because studies have shown that the brain learns and stores better if you practice in shorter amounts of time with many breaks in between. It turns out that the breaks in between is where the real progress <laughs> takes place. Now, this is something that blew me away based on that information. The brain itself performs a mental instant replay of those actions while you're actually taking that break. So even though your body is not practicing or training, your brain still is during that break. Your brain is actually replaying that exact same function that you just got through doing without you even knowing about it. In fact, scientists recently discovered that the enduring memory to execute a new skill is not developed while you're actually performing the skill but after it, 
These same neural networks that are activated during a training session automatically replay these same sequences mentally during breaks between practice and after. Now, one more thing to blow your mind, during those mental subconscious training sessions that your brain is performing, not you, the brain is actually performing those same actions up to 20 times and a minimum actually of 20 times faster than you actually do it. So if you see, and it's a fast one, if you see Max Michelle doing and performing his own draw right here, as quick and smooth as that is, his brain when he takes a break is doing that 20 times faster than he's performing that exact same world record breaking task. Now, am I saying that because of those breaks in between your practices that you can pretty much can the whole practice session? Of course not. You have to give the brain something to work with. If you're not doing any training, then the brain has nothing to replay. So you need to give it something to work with, but don't kill yourself by overtraining. And again, learning bad sloppy habits. If you're getting into a training session where you're starting to get sloppy, your brain is starting to calculate that. Your brain may realize or think rather that you want that type of action. The brain doesn't know that if you're doing a draw that you that you don't want it to be a complete and total waste of movement. Maybe the brain thinks that if you're doing this over and over and over again in a real sloppy way, that that's maybe how you want to do it. So you have to make sure that when you start getting rough around the edges and a little bit sloppy, stop practicing. I'm never gonna be able to draw like Max Michelle can, but at the same time, I can use the same methods he does and get better over time. So I'm competing with myself on getting better. And that's what we all need to do is compare our progress to our own progress, to our own set of skills. Again, if we compare ours to a guy like a Max Michelle, well, we're just gonna get really discouraged more than anything, and you may just bail out of it altogether. Keep track of your own times. If you're doing a draw, get a shot timer and time those draws. Again, small bite-sized segments, a little bit of practice, let the brain do the rest of the work. Start timing those and document those and compare that. That's what you should be working against, how fast Paul draws. And then I'm gonna get to a point where I start to see that those incremental increases and betterment of my time. And that's when I start gaining confidence and really be able to start competing, but also be able to effectively and quickly draw in the event that I need to protect myself or my family.